welcome our speaker today, who is Helen Bash Turkman. Um, I shall introduce her now. Helen uh, currently teaches um, uh, courses on discourse analysis and English for specific purposes at the University of Auckland, New Zealand. She's written two books on English for specific purposes, Lawrence Ulbaum, 2006, and Palgrave Macmillan, 2010, and edited English for Academic Purposes in the Critical Concepts in Linguistics series, that's Routledge, 2015. Prior to this, she worked as an ESOL teacher and teacher educator in the Middle East for many, many years. So, um, Helen, if you'd like to um, appear and unmute yourself, then um, there we go, then the world can see you. Hello, everybody. Brilliant. That's great. We can see and hear you uh, right the other side of the world from us. So Helen is in um, New Zealand. Hi, um, OK, uh, over to you then, if you'd like to try and uh, open up the presentation. And hi, 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 yeah, hi to everybody. Many, many, many countries that I've seen represented there. Yes, the it's amazing to see all those countries flashing up. It's so exciting. It's fantastic. Okay, so I shall so disappear now and I shall leave it. Uh, in, in right. Your so I'll go into my share screen now. All right. That's it. <clears throat> Okay, so this one and share. Okay, okay, everybody. Uh-huh, just a second. Okay, well, um, I'm very excited to be with you all today. Um, and as Simon has said, my name is Helen. I'm, I'm in New Zealand and in New Zealand it's night time now, but I can see you come from all these other countries, so I can't even imagine all the range of times that you're at. Well, a very warm welcome to my talk. I'm going to be talking about methodologies, teaching methodologies, the sorts of strategies and techniques teachers might use a bit, and also materials in teaching English for academic purposes. So um, I expect a lot of you are EAP teachers out there or perhaps people who are going to be EAP teachers. Okay, so I hope this talk will be of relevance to your work. Now, why did I choose this topic? Well, I think it's a really important topic um, in EAP to look at teaching method methodologies and materials. And there's two big reasons for that. The first reason is in English for academic purposes, the role of needs analysis is very important. What we do is we try to identify quite precisely the language needs and the language skills needs of our students. And then we design material to meet those needs. Now, this is quite different from general English language teaching where we, you know, we might be teaching um, general skills or general English and we're not necessarily needing therefore to design anything very specific to, to meet their needs. Um, in EAP, we can't always rely on course book materials and there's a number of reasons for that. Firstly, we might be teaching in an area of English for academic purposes, perhaps we're teaching English for physiotherapists and we, or people who are studying physiotherapists and there simply aren't published course books out there on which we can rely. Or we might be teaching a group for whom there is some ready material. For example, we might be teaching English for nursing students and we might draw on some of the materials that have been published. For example, in the Cambridge Professional English series, there's a book on English for nursing studies. We might draw on that, but we probably can't rely completely on a course book the way that our colleagues in general English language might, might do because even good quality published um, materials are not gonna fit exactly the needs of our particular group of students. And we've probably been thinking a lot about their needs and working out their needs. So in EAP particularly, teachers do a lot of materials development and a lot of materials adaptation to adapting materials. I'm going to give a little bit of background now so that, you, so that you're familiar with the terms I'm going to use in the remainder of today's talk. So please do bear with me on this. Um, of course, we've got EAP, 
English for academic purposes, but what I'm really looking at is a particular branch of EAP, which is English for study purposes. So for teaching students at universities, typically their study purposes. I'm going to also be using the term English for general academic purposes or EGAP. And by that, I mean that, for example, you have a group in your class of students, you have students who are from different disciplines in the university, or they're heading or targeting different disciplines in the university. And what you're trying to teach them is something about what we would call general academic English you know, some of the vocabulary that's generally used in academic English, looking at some of the text types that we think are used across different disciplines. So that's a very sort of general academic English field. But a number of you, and quite a few people now working in EAP, are working in the area of English for specific academic purposes. And what I mean is they're teaching students who are either in or heading for a particular discipline in the in, in the university and a couple of I've, I've mentioned already you might be teaching English to students of nursing so your teaching would be very much focused on the English for nursing studies or you might be teaching students who are doing economics and finance at the university so you'll be teaching English for finance study that's an area of ESAP Okay, so those are some of the terms I'll be using in my talk. I guess a lot of you are very familiar with these already, but I just want it to be on the safe side. Just a few words again about needs analysis. It really is a key step in developing courses in EAP and indeed in ESP as well. And the reason for that is we're in actually a very privileged position if we're teaching in English academic purposes and we usually can identify the precise language needs of our particular class of students. And because of that, we can, we're in that privileged position of being able to, ta to create tailored to fit teaching and materials, okay? And our colleagues in general English language teaching may not be in this position at all. What we know from, well, I, what I know from a, a great deal of research and talking to EAP teachers actually around the world is that EAP teachers typically spend a lot of time and effort developing in-house materials and adapting materials. It really takes up a lot of their time and their creative energy. By in-house materials, I mean materials for their particular institution, their particular class, their particular school. So it's something really worth thinking about because it is a, it's a big part of the workload in EAP teaching. Thinking about EAP teachers, we know too, and I, I expect this will be true for lots of people in the audience, that a very many EAP teachers started their teaching careers in teaching English, you know, general English language teaching, and then later on moved into the field of EAP. Partly because of that, EAP teaching draws on teaching methods commonly used in general English language teaching and vice versa. So we've got examples that we can look at of teaching ideas, types of materials that were originally created in EAP, which have then been transferred to or picked up by general English language teaching and indeed the other way around. So we're not talking about materials and methodologies as being mutually exclusive in these two divisions. However, my key point would be that some teaching methodologies and materials, they're not unique to e English for academic purposes, but arguably they're much more characteristic of EAP teaching than general English language teaching. And by that, I mean that we're, we'd see them more predominantly in English for academic purposes. We'd see them more often, more teachers would be using these methods and materials than would be the case in a general English language teaching setting. So first of all, I'd like to start looking at some of the ways 
teaching methodologies and materials can be distinctive in EAP. First of all, some of the, the reasons for the distinction is because our learners can be a little bit different too, a little bit special. In teaching English for academic purposes, typically we're dealing with or teaching adults or young adults. And typically too, we're teaching students who have already got some English proficiency, usually intermediate level or, or above. I mean, it is possible to teach EAP to elementary beginner students. It's, it's entirely possible, but typically the situation is that students have already got some sort of grounding in English, some knowledge of what we might call the basics, and then they come into the EAP um, classroom. Another point here, students may, it's not always the case, of course, students may have experience of studying in their particular discipline. And so what they bring to the English for academic purposes classroom is that knowledge they've developed of disciplinary communication. And we can draw on that in our um, teaching methods and materials. So that's another plus. Our learners, and here's yet another plus, aren't we lucky, are often highly motivated. Um, towards their language learning. Um, this again is, is very often the case in English for specific academic purposes, because they know that what you're doing is tailored for their needs. So it's also relevant. So why not, you know, how good can it be? So because our students are highly motivated, it's possible to include longer learning tasks and project work in our teaching. Now, longer tasks and project work require quite a lot of student engagement. We might, we might be working on the same task or project over a week or even over a month. And, you know, we probably couldn't do that in a general English language teaching situation. And typically tasks and activities can be quite short. You might have a task for 20 minutes or one hour, but it really is possible to do these more engaging longer term projects and tasks with EAP learners. And I'm going to be illustrating some, a couple of examples of that from the literature today. And our learners too often easily perceive the relevance of our teaching and materials. They know that it's for them, for their studies, for their academic work. So we don't have to do so much kind of selling English, you know, selling um, the tasks that we're using in our teaching. In general English language teaching, teachers often have an introductory or warm up sort of stage for an activity why they, where they try to get the students interested in the topic or motivated towards the task. We don't have to put all of that sort of pre-work in with EAP because it's obvious that this is relevant. They're going to be interested in the text because it's from their field of study. There are also some factors for distinction around teaching itself. Um, a lot of teaching in EAP can directly focus on academic language use. We can use, and we often do use, a lot of language analysis type activities where we try to get our students to notice particular features, linguistic features in academic texts or just samples of academic language. Now, I think you'll all be very, very, very familiar with those language analysis type activities. So I'm not going to talk about them much anymore because I expect they're well known to you, but they do take up a big part of EAP teaching. ESAP teachers, that's teachers of English for specific academic purposes, may have less knowledge of the target discipline than their learners. For example, if you're teaching English to students of finance, they might know a lot more about finance than you do if they've already been studying it. And they've become sort of familiar with some of the communication and the disciplinary language relating to finance. So the students can, in, to some extent, have more knowledge than you, but that's okay because one of the things you can do in your teaching strategy 
is to take on the role of a language consultant or a facilitator and provide information on language points arising if they ask you. So in general English language teaching, quite a, a lot of the time, many teachers, not all teachers, of course, are involved in a kind of PPE sequence where, you know, you upfront the presentation of material with the idea of language on with the idea that students don't know it. So you present it, then you get them to practice it in a controlled fashion, then you get them to produce it. You don't necessarily need to do that in ESAP. You can use a deep end strategy, which as the name suggests, you throw the students in the deep end and you get them to produce the language, perhaps produce a writing task or a role play as the starting point. And then they can ask you questions. Oh, you know, I want to say this here, but I don't quite know the language to say it. Or this is what we do when we're writing this text, but how would I say it in English? So it's very possible in a situation like this to take on a quite a different role as a teacher and be a language consultant. And another facet of teaching is, of course, that we try to use real world tasks in our teaching, by which I mean tasks replicating actual study practices, what people actually do while they're studying in the university or studying finance or studying nursing rather than pedagogical tasks. We can use those real world tasks, so we need to find out what they are. And I'm going to show you some examples of that very, very shortly. OK, so I've shown you sort of some of the factors why teaching methodologies and materials can be a di bit different in EAP. And they offer us some options that our colleagues in general English language teaching might not necessarily enjoy. Teaching can also draw on methodologies and learning styles associated. Can I just switch that off a little bit? Or no, no, okay. Learning styles associated with the um, general or general academic or specific academic fields. For example, um, students of medicine. One of the things, or one of the ways students in that area or in that disciplinary air is learn is through analyzing and diagnosing so we might choose act activities that draw on that skill set so we might for example try to get our learners analyzing and diagnosing language problems or things that are wrong in the language um, uh, projects might be used to devise nutritional education presentations for students of nutrition. I'm going to tell you more about that example in a minute. Why? Because in that field, it's a real world task that students do. Nutritionists have to present nutritional education seminars as part of their work. So we could use that sort of methodology in our um, teaching of English. For example, case studies is a methodology used for teaching business and for teaching law and also teaching social studies, um, social, social care work. So we could use case study methodologies in our English language teaching as well. There's a very nice example of that actually in the Cambridge University Press um, material called, I think it's called Flight Path, which is for people who are learning to be pilots and air traffic control, and they look at um, a helicopter crash case study. It's quite a long engaged task, but it's the sort of activity you'd really do if you're training to be a pilot. Another possibility for our teaching is to try and accommodate the fact that we might have students from different disciplines in our class. Now, I spoke earlier on about English for general academic purposes and English for specific academic purposes. And it may give the impression that they, they have to be totally different. Sometimes it's possible to kind of merge them and produce a kind of hybrid. I'll give you an example of that from my own teaching here at the University of Auckland. Um, I was working with a colleague, Neil Matheson, teaching a first year university writing course. 
And in that course, there were students from all different disciplines around the university. Now, although most of the course focused on some general text types that we thought all students use, like how to write student essays, it was possible to embed a focus on disciplinary text samples within that. So, for example, when, when we were teaching how to write the introduction to an essay, um, we gave some general information about essay introductions, what you could say that would nearly always be the case across the university. But then we drew on a text bank, bank of samples of student writing that we'd collected from around the university. And we'd put students into different groups. Some of the students who, you know, students who were doing the science subjects in one group, students who were doing um, psychology, in, who were going to study or go studying psychology in another group, in another, et cetera. And then we gave them the samples of student introductions from students essays in their discipline for them to look at and see how students had written introductions for their psychology essays. So sometimes we can bring these two sort of orientations towards EAP teaching together. Okay, time to have a look at just a couple of samples um, that I've collected um, from the literature here. One of them's quite an old one and one of them's a much more recent one. Um, I haven't got examples of all the different things I've talked about today, but I have got a couple of examples of what I would call real world and longer tasks and project work. And I've chosen these because I think they can be quite inspiring. They might give you some ideas um, that something, you know, you might be able to think of something like that for your for your own teaching. And if you haven't done um, project work or long tasks before, maybe you will branch out into that. So my first example is called the box kite task. Now look, this is a really old one. It comes, it was reported in Swales 1985. And it's really been an inspiration to my teaching in a number of ways. Um, the teaching situation was that the teacher was called Herbalik and he was teaching English to students of engineering at the University of Kuwait. Now, I found this really interesting because I too taught English to students of engineering at the University of, Qu of Kuwait, but some, some time later. And in his work, Herbalik was required by the department to teach a course on technical report writing in English. Now the students all had Arabic as their first language, but they're fairly intermediate or above sort of learners. And he was to, tasked with giving them a course on technical report writing. Now, when you see a topic like that, technical report writing, you might think, well, how boring could this possibly be? But no, 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 um, it really wasn't as you'll see. And one of the units, in his technical report writing course was on writing a manual, you know, uh, a technical manual. You know, if you go out and buy like a washing machine, you get that booklet that comes with it that shows all the parts of the machine and explain how it works. So what the students were learning was how to write a technical manual, something like that. Now, in writing a technical man manual, the writer needs to know how to operate the machinery or how to produce something. So Herbalik decided that his students would construct box kites. I'm just going to go forward and show you a picture of a box kite. Here it is. It's a box kite. So it's like a kite that you normally fly in the air. It's a kind of toy or amusement. But a box kite is a three dimensional structure. So it's more tricky to construct. It's more tricky to get it flying because it's heavy and you really have to think about the physics and the maths and the engineering to design something like this which will actually fly. Okay so Herbalik decided his students would construct box kites. Now this was an enjoyable task. 
It was something new for the students. I'm sure they had never done that before. It required engineering skills. And of course, they're interested in engineering, aren't they? Because they're studying, studying it. They would have to use really relevant language to talk about construct, so the language of engineering in English, of course. And at that time, there was little ready information available that they could just get off the internet or something like that. So what ha actually happened in the tasks, the students worked in pairs and they had to produce a tangible object. They had to actually construct a box kite and they had to test that it would fly. So they had to, you know, work out the maths and the physics and the aerodynamics. And they also had to write the technical man manual in English, of course, explaining how the kites were constructed and how they were operated. So that's a very nice combination of, you know, a real world task, engineering skills um, and the, the using the language of um, engineering. OK, so that was the box kite task. My second example today comes from Japan and I've called it recipe writing project. And I took this from a report by a writer called Tasuda. And Tasuda um, had been asked by her institution to set up a course of English for students of nutrition and dietitians in the university and she looked around and guess what there's no published course book there's no ready material there was pretty well nothing and so she had to devise the course and her materials herself which is often quite a common thing to happen so part of her work in teaching them was that she devised um, a book called recipes of fukuoka she gave them vocabulary quizzes and in her course she got the students practicing writing recipes and in English, it was a big part of her course because nutritionists work a lot on writing recipes as well as thinking about education, um, ed nutritional needs. And to, to, to show their achievements to their classmates and to get a sense of their accomplishment in learning English for nutritional studies, she had her students write about a signature dish, their signature dish, one dish, one recipe that they were very good at. Maybe they actually created this recipe and I'm sure it had to be absolutely nutritionally sound as well. And they had to write this recipe and talk about this recipe in English with an illustration. And then um, in, she tells us that at the end of the year, they had a recipe contest and they all presented their signature dish and the signature dish information in English, of course. And they invited an English speaking judge to come in and see which and judge which was the best recipe and presumably the most neutral, you know, one that was very nutritionally good as well. So there were three reasons for that, that contest. First of all, the contest motivated the students to write recipes in English, which is what they need to learn to do. Um, and they hadn't done that before the course had started. Secondly, it gave students a really good opportunity to interact with English speakers, the judge and judging panel in a real life situation, because you do have to present your recipes to experts in nutrition in this field. And thirdly, the students could know what kind of comments on their English recipe could be understood through the comments of the judge. So how good was their English really in writing up this recipe? Because if the judge said, well, I don't understand what you mean by this, they got very good feedback, didn't they, on how well they were able to communicate an idea in English. OK, so I've pretty well come to the end of my talk today, but I'd just like to bring it all together with a few general points, ideas called key considerations in EAP methodologies and materials development. Firstly, the importance of aligning teaching and our materials to learners needs as identify in needs analysis. I think that's very key. Secondly, as always, and I'm sure you've heard lots about this elsewhere, including plenty of ag academic language analysis, noticing type activities, using whenever possible, of course, authentic academic language samples. 
Now, it's quite difficult sometimes to have good descriptions of language, academic language, especially, and you know, in disciplinary areas that you may not be that familiar with. You know, I might be teaching English for nursing studies, but I haven't actually been a nurse. So it's quite difficult. So wherever possible, try to enlist the help or advice of a subject specialist. So somebody from the nursing profession or a professor of nursing in that situation, um, especially to check any of the language descriptions you present your material. Is that right? Is that what they say? Is that what they write? Is that how they write it in that field? in that discipline and to check how um, authentic your tasks are is that are they really the sorts of things that you students do in that field so you know yes writing recipes and having to present your signature recipes is something that would happen in nutritional studies but you need if possible to get some sort of um, help well certainly advice from a subject specialist if you can it's not always possible Typically, we try to include authentic texts and tasks from the learner's discipline. I think this goes, you know, we all know this, but so just as an example, if you're teaching English to students of finance in the university, you could get, um, get, get one or two of their finance textbooks from their studies, use some samples of parts of chapters for your work in the English for academic purposes classroom. That would be an authentic text, wouldn't it? And one that's really interesting for the students. And it's one that they're dealing with anyway. So they, they, would, they would appreciate that. Another point here, the importance of recognizing learners' knowledge of their discipline if you're working in ESAP, if they have knowledge, if they've already been studying or know about the discipline. And we can draw on that knowledge in our teachings. For example, we might use a deep end strategy and act as a language consultant. We can devise teaching and materials that draw on the teaching and learning methodologies and styles associated with the discipline. Um, I talked about, um, for example, um, you know, tasks that require case study methodology we might be able to use when students do case studies in their disciplinary subjects like law. And one of the points I've made quite strongly and illustrated today is that, you know, the value of including real world and longer tasks and projects. So um, that's it from me for, for now. I think I'll be really, um, oops, I've gone, gone the wrong way. Um, so there's a few references there, but I expect you might want to look at those later. And I'm ready to answer your questions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Helen. That was, that was very good, really interesting and very nicely paced, may I, may I add, it was lovely. Um, yeah, lots and lots of questions. Let, let me start with somebody wanted clarification on the deep end. What is the deep end strategy? But um, I'd, I'd like to add to that and say, how easy is that to do in practice as well? Because um, obviously you're going to have a lot of groups of students that are stopping and starting and trying to ask you, what does this mean? How do we do that? How do I say that? So a quick clarification on what deep end strategy is and then how you manage that as a teacher. How would you manage it? Well, um, deep end strategy, as the name suggests, you drop them in the deep end and you ask them to produce a text or produce a piece of writing like a uh, speaking like a role play, rather than you giving them language that they may use in their role plan or telling them what they're going to, how they're going to organize their writing in advance. You simply ask them to do the task and then respond to questions as they come. Now, to some extent, that's much easier than doing a lot of teaching at the beginning because you have to develop all that teaching and think what, what you're gonna teach and how you're gonna teach it. You don't necessarily need to do it. You know, you just need to find a task, get them doing it, respond to questions. Now, what happens if everybody asks questions at the same time? Um, I don't know. I mean, what do teachers always do? When you go around groups, you know, if they have a question, they ask you. Um, my experience has been that you get some questions sometimes. Um, you know, as always with group work, tasks, another possibility is when students are working in groups, if you think you can't 
answer all of their questions at the time. You might just go round, listen to some groups, make a few notes of any language gaps or particular language problems that seem to be coming up a lot. And then when they're finished the task, say, okay, do you have any questions? And secondly, you know, I noticed a couple of things there. I think I might help you with the language for that. So um, I hope that's um, a couple of ideas about managing. Okay, thank you. We'll move on. The question from Roxana, I quite like this one, um, says, I'm going to teach university students of maths who are fresh more, but the book the authority prepared is specifically for students of chemistry. <laughs> Therefore, it is a little challenging um, uh, yeah, to provide material and motivation for math students. So what can I do in this situation? I think, Roxana, that you will, um, you're required to use the material from chemistry. It sounds really strange. Um, uh, I guess you might start with that and over time, start bringing in your own materials, developing some of your own materials. Um, I can't see a big link between maths and chemistry. I'd see a bigger link between maths and physics, to be honest. It does seem a little bit odd. You might like to talk to whoever you know, told you to do this to explain that it would be much better to use some materials and some texts to do with learning, you know, maths rather than chemistry. I can't imagine how, how that would be. Um, over time, develop some materials. I think one of the things we often think as teachers is that we have to get all the materials ready for a course right at, before we even start. And so we're in a huge pressure, but we, we can start and, you know, as the weeks progress, start building in our own materials or adapting the materials. Maybe there's some nice ideas with the chemistry materials and you could simply use them with some some maths examples instead. The language of maths is, is quite specific and precise. So I'm not quite sure how you're gonna manage that. Could, could you invite students to bring material to the, to the classroom so the emphasis yeah. is on them as well? And... Yeah, they could bring in um, sample. For, I'm just thinking, I don't know much about teaching English for maths, I must say. But the questions that you're asked in maths, you know, when they give you a problem to solve, there's quite a lot of language in them, around them. And I think one of the things we know from research is that students, ESL students, struggle a lot with the language in the maths problems. That's where the tricky bit is. So if they could bring in some of those real world maths problems that they're being given in their maths courses, you could then use those, couldn't you, to... Um, you know, talk about how language is used and you yourself as a teacher can start analysing it and working out what might be some of the linguistic features involved there. Great. Well, bring it, go yeah. On. Sorry, Good. go on. I, I was going to say we've got lots of questions. Let's just keep, uh, keep going as much as we can. Okay. So question from Martin. Hi, Helen. Some EAP groups will have a very mixed level of English uh, in the larger groups. Any tips on how to manage this? I couldn't hear the beginning of your question. Something in what groups? Some EAP groups will have very mixed levels of English in, and any tips on how to manage this in, with the larger groups? Yeah, it's always a difficulty, isn't it, Martin, when you've got different levels going on. Um, I mean, one of the things I've used, I mean, I would use this in general English language teaching, not only in EAP situations, but when you develop materials or even a, just a, an activity for your class, you know, if you've got, if there's three parts to the activity, everybody does part one and two, and then the students who finish quickly do part three as well, which is really a little bit more challenging. But, you know, they don't feel the other students aren't don't feel bad that they didn't finish part three. So you say, everybody, please do part one and two. And students who finish early, please mm -hmm. do part three of the activity. Um, that would be something I can think of to do there. That's Another possibility might be to get, you know, in pairing students who are a bit more advanced to students who are not so advanced and you know getting the more advanced student to to explain some of the things or show show the other student what they're doing and learning from them now it's often said isn't it that that's very frustrating for the students who are more advanced that they're working with somebody a student who is not as a 
advance. But what we do know from research in second language acquisition, so another field there, that being put in the role of the teacher or the expert is really very good for the person's language development because they're mm -hmm. ending up explaining it to their peer. And through that, they learn a lot and they get a lot too. So that might be another thing to do. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. How do we grade the content for a student's work if we are not experts in their field? Do we only grade, do we just concentrate on, the, on their English? Is the, is the yeah, it's very hard to separate disciplinary content from disciplinary mm. language. I mean, they are so inter intertwined. What can you do? Um, I would try not to grade the content um, as far as possible. So I would come up with some criteria for my marking that would be expressed in language terms, you know, like expresses. If we go back to the kite example, the technical manual, you know, something like expresses concepts clearly. I mean, if I can sort of understand it, that would be good enough. Now, whether the concept that they're talking about from maths or physics for the kite is accurate according to a mathematician or a physicist, I don't care, but it's kind of good enough for me to get an idea that they can express a concept in English, but I'm not checking the technical um, correctness of the maths that they might be talking about. Sure. Uh, another one about multidisciplinary uh, students in, you know, in a mixed groups, for example, yeah. how, how, how do you deal with that? You've got a, a lawyer and an engineer sort of paired together, perhaps. How, how do you, um, yeah, what's the common path there? How do you? Well, I mean, the, the, the typical path has been, or the typical approach is if you've got students from disciplines, then just teach English for general academic purposes. You know, the general variety of English genres, text types that you would see across disciplines. Now, I mean, some of you will be familiar with a lot of the theoretical discussion in English for academic purposes after the, over the last two decades, which has really emphasized that there is no such thing as English for general academic purposes because all disciplinary, all academic language use is related to one discipline or nothing or another. So it's only teachers who have made up a kind of phantom register called general English for academic purposes. Um, but if you are, have got mixed students and you do want to show them some, you know, samples from their own disciplines, then you can kind of, as you remember my example where I talked about our work with the writing introductions to essays, showing them some text samples from their discipline. So although most of your class might be about some general ideas, on that text type or that task, such as writing a particular kind of assignment, you know, if you can bring in some samples or they can bring in some samples, I think Simon's talked about getting the students to bring in samples from their own disciplines to look at in class. Another possibility, and this is an idea that was developed very much by Ann Johns in the US, is yes, this is the situation we have often do have students from different disciplines. So what we can ask them to do is to become researchers of language use in their own disciplines. So what we do in the English for academic purposes class is get set up some tasks, which are basically research tasks. And then the students go to their disciplines and they try and find out what are the text types that are being used. Can I collect some samples? Bringing them into class. How can we analyze this? What patterns can I see in those texts that I collected from my discipline? So it's the idea of the learners becoming researchers of their own disciplinary communities. That might be another way to, to go forward. I'll just end on, on the last question here. It's, I was just smiling there because somebody said, I'd love to go to New Zealand and have tea with Professor Helen. Anyway, so. That would be nice. <laughs> Let me just end on this final one here. <laughs> um, what, what, what do you do? This is probably about motivation. And I, I think we always, you know, it's a, it's a key question. What, what do you do if students get overwhelmed by tasks from their subject area? Do you, do you feel that their English suffers get put to the back? Um, and therefore, how do you keep these people going when they are overwhelmed? We understand that there's a lot to do in their own uh, in their own disciplines and then they have to do English as well. Yes. 
So if you can, you know, what is it they're overwhelmed with in their disciplines? What is it they're having to produce in writing or speaking in English in their disciplines? What is it? Can we help you with that in the English for Academic Purposes classroom? You know, so never mind what I thought we were going to be teaching this week or this month. You bring in, you tell me what, what's happening and let's start looking at it. And there's nothing wrong with that because at the end of the day, we are teaching English for them to be successful in their disciplinary studies. And through working together on some of those tasks they're being given, that could, could be the way. I mean, there's a very nice example. I think it was um, Sarah Benesh in the States. She had students and, you know, in her class and they were in, her, it was called an ESL class. It was in the States, but it was essentially an EAP class. And her students, most of them were taking psychology classes and they were, totally overwhelmed with the enormous reading list that the, the professor had given them. And they really couldn't understand half the readings either. They were just so difficult. So um, she had a number of things she tried with her mm. students. One of the things she did was she invited the um, psychology lecturer to come to her class, I believe, and to go over one or two of the readings with the students in that environment. And then the, the professor kind of got the idea that these are actually ESL students and it might not be that straightforward and they might not understand absolutely everything. So that was one thing she tried. Um, she also got them um, writing letters, I believe. Was it that? No, that was something else. I, I've kind of forgotten my track of thought there. Um, maybe talking about techniques they could use to you know to be selective about the number of readings they actually read from that terrible list yeah i know it's it's the real world it's tough isn't it that's great but that's a great that that is a very good answer i mean i think most people a lot of teachers are there to help because they do care um and i think listening to them instead of just plowing on and doing your usual lesson is, is a great is a great tip <laughs> So, so that's fantastic. So thank you very much. And oh, that's my it. Um, okay. just, oh, I was just starting to enjoy myself. I don't want to go now. <laughs> <laughs> I know the, the time goes quickly, doesn't it? When, yeah, you're, when yeah. you're having fun. Um, but thank you ever so much. That was really, really. Right. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And um, I wish all of our and listeners just for everybody very else. Best.